it's uh, a great pleasure to be able to tell you about my hobby. Mm -hmm. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, said that the reason that physics books are full of mathematics and equations and biology books are full of words and pictures is that physics is easy and biology is hard. Now, living things depend on their environment. And it's becoming increasingly important that we understand their dependence on their environment because we have a changing climate, we have an energy crisis, we have an increasing human population, and we have a loss of biological diversity. Now, living things depend on their environment for nutrients and for free energy. Free energy is a difficult concept. It's the energy that's available to do things. It's hard to understand the flow of free energy through cells. It's really difficult to understand it flowing through animals and plants. And we're not doing very well in understanding it flowing through ecosystems. But that's arguably our most important problem. We're living through the sixth mass extinction. The number of wild animals has fallen by 50% since 1970. The number of tigers has fallen by 97% in the last century. Will your grandchildren see a tiger? Well, only in David Attenborough's films. We have to understand this. There are some things we can understand. The number of swifts has fallen by 50% or so in the last 20 years. And we know why this is happening. Because the flying insects that they eat are also declining very quickly. Now you may say the swifts are declining because their food's disappearing. A physicist would say it's due to the lack of free energy. Right? So we have to study free energy. Let's start with cells. Living things are made up of cells. And in human beings, there are about 200 different types of cells. And they're a collection of an enormous number of different sorts of molecules, all interacting with each other. Two of the most important types of molecules are DNA and proteins. And the questions we want to ask is, what is their structure? What do they do? And how do they do it? And the answers are in physics. So let's take DNA. We know the structure. It's a double helix, and it's in the nucleus of cells. What does it do? It stores instructions for making proteins. How do they do it? We don't know. Proteins. Well, we know the structures of about 40,000 of them. That's very much less than the total number of proteins. What do they do? Everything. Proteins do everything in living things. How do they do it? We don't know. This shows the structure of ATP synthase, which is a molecule that is used to make ATP. ATP is the energy molecule that is used to take free energy round all living things, animals, plants, fungi. Life uses just this one molecule. Now, if there's a secret of life, it's the mechanism by which biological systems organize themselves. How do biological systems self-organize and maintain themselves? Think of DNA. It's made up of pairs of molecules called bases, adenine coupled to thiamine, cytosine coupled to guanine. And it's a double helix. And there are four billion bases in every cell of a human being. It's two meters long, and it's folded up into two microns. Genes are the instructions for making proteins. They're about 300 bases long. Every day, DNA in all your cells is unraveled and unraveled and unraveled and unraveled, read 
and then put back. You have an alcoholic drink. There's a signal from the stomach. We have a problem. So let some of the cells unwind and unwind and unwind and find the gene that makes the protein that deals with alcohol. So that's how the system works. Now, free energy. To understand free energy, we have to go to the laws of thermodynamics. And there are lots of ways of presenting these laws. The one I like is that you can't win, you can't break even. You're not allowed to leave the game. So the real problem, whoops, the real problem is that the second law of thermodynamics says that entropy always increases and that free energy, whenever you use free energy, you increase entropy. The second law predicts decay, disorder, and death. And we know that happens to every living thing. The question is, how do we get away with it for so long? The end is ultimate death, but we avoid it for a long time. And we do it by exploiting the energy that flows through a system. Now, the energy in a system at a temperature T is KT, which is Boltzmann's constant. Let's look at free energy flows. This is a river flowing past a rock, and it gives rise to eddies. And if the river stops flowing, the eddies die. Notice we say the eddies die because the free energy has stopped flowing. And life on Earth depends on a flow of free energy coming from the sun. We get high-quality energy, and we dissipate low-quality energy. We do not take energy from the sun, otherwise the temperature would just keep on rising. We take high-quality energy, free energy, and we turn it into low-quality energy. And we live on the flow. So let's look again at this mechanism of biological organization. How does DNA do all that unraveling and all that raveling up again? Well, we've said the energy available for life at room temperature is KT. That corresponds to vibrations of 6 times 10 to the 12 hertz, or terahertz. It corresponds to wavelengths of about 300 microns. We call this the terahertz region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And here's where we have a problem. The electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from microwaves and radio waves to gamma rays and x-rays. But there's a little gap in the middle here at about 10 to the 12 hertz, called the terahertz gap, where we can't generate terahertz electromagnetic waves at all easily. But this is the range that's important for life. And the fact that we can't generate these waves easily is probably the reason why we understand so little about living things. If you use a laboratory source to generate terahertz radiation, then at one terahertz, you can generate 100 microwatts. But with accelerators, we can start to solve this problem. So this shows the power that you can get with different sources. Suppose you think of your electric fire, then you can get this much energy out of the system. If you have a synchrotron, you can do about 100 times better. If you have an energy re recovery linear accelerator, you can do a great deal better than that. And with nine orders of magnitude improvement in energy, even a physicist can study biology. So let's talk about synchrotrons. This shows the synchrotron, the European Synchrotron Radiation Facility in Grenoble. It's an enormous machine with electrons passing around an evacuated cylinder between two rivers. 
with large magnetic fields, an electron gun which excites bunches of electrons to 200 million electron volts, and then a booster system which pushes the energy up to six giga electron volts. And the electrons in the storage ring go round and round and round all day. And as they go through magnets, then they generate electromagnetic radiation. And they generate a broad band of electromagnetic radiation. The first two generations of synchrotrons were used to generate this radiation from bending magnets. Then the technologists got much cleverer and put in straight sections into synchrotrons where they put in wiggling magnets called undulators where they could wiggle the electron beam and get much better control over the light electromagnetic waves coming out. Now, the main driver for building synchrotron radiation is to study proteins. Remember, I said we only know the structures of about 40,000 proteins. That's very much less than the number of proteins we know of and the number of proteins we want to understand. And what you do with a synchrotron is you shine an X-ray beam onto a crystal, you detect the diffraction pattern from the crystal, and if you're very clever, you can deduce the structure. And this is the molecule ATP synthase. That's its structure, and that makes ATP the energy molecule of all living things. And the structure of that was deduced at the Darsbury synchrotron. So the main driver for building synchrotrons is to get high energy x-rays. And this means the machine gets bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more expensive. But the region we're interested in with terahertz is down here. And this is cheap. So we need to make small synchrotrons to get terahertz radiation. We need to construct terahertz beam lines. And with a traditional synchrotron, it doesn't much matter what sort of energy it runs, you get about 200 milliwatts of average power. Now, this is how light source technology has developed. The first generation synchrotrons were built by particle physicists to smash particles together to understand the structure of matter. And the UK built the Darsbury MENA accelerator. We physicists, ordinary physicists, not these high energy guys, we were parasites on using this synchrotron radiation. Unfortunately, we killed the host, but we were able to generate second generation light sources which were dedicated to our use. These are storage rings, and the first dedicated synchrotron was built at Darsbury Laboratory. Third generation synchrotrons, where you put in straight sections and have much more control of the light, the UK's built one of those. This is the diamond synchrotron at the Rutherford Laboratory. Now, fourth generation light sources are what we need for terahertz. And there are two sorts of these, energy recovery linear accelerators, ERLs, and free electron lasers. And Darsbury built the ALICE accelerator and an infrared free electron laser, which we've just put into mothballs while we think of upgrading it. This is the ALICE accelerator. It's different to a synchrotron because the electrons go round only once. In a synchrotron, the electrons go round 10 to the 11 times, and the radiation they emit is a broad band because the electrons have spread out. In an energy recovery linear accelerator, this is the third one to be built in the world, the only one in Europe, you excite your electron bunch and you send it into the booster and you send it all the way around. And when it comes back, it's out of phase 
with the accelerating unit. And so it gives its energy up, which is passed to the next bunch, and that bunch is dumped. Now, by doing, by doing that, you keep the bunch of electrons very small. And if the bunch of electrons is smaller than the wavelengths that is emitted when it goes through a magnet, you get a massive increase in power. So this is the output of Alice. When you get down to the bunch being smaller than the wavelength, you get another six to eight order of magnitude of power, 10 kilowatts. Now this looks a quite frightening amount of power, but because the bunch is kept together, it's pulsed. And if you wanted to boil a kettle with this instrument, it would take you six months. But the energy is very concentrated, so you can see what it does. And we built a tissue culture facility on this machine where we could do research on biological systems. And so the terahertz radiation is taken up these big beam pipes into a tissue culture facility. And this is cleared for work on cancer, satisfies all the requirements for studying cancer. If you want to study living cells, you have to keep them alive in incubators in a carbon dioxide atmosphere at a controlled temperature. And we could take the terahertz radiation into the incubator and into the flow cabinet. So we could study living cells. Now the first question is, is terahertz radiation safe? Because people have not been exposed to intense terahertz radiation before. Remember, genes make proteins that do everything, and they come from the structure of DNA. And we think that the modes of vibration that DNA uses to make proteins are in the terahertz region. So is terahertz safe? Cancer results from damage to DNA. Well, we can at last answer that question. Terahertz radiation is safe. We did 18 experiments on human embryonic stem cells and were able to show that nothing really happened. And I gave that talk at a conference in San Francisco and I was followed immediately by Ljubljana Titova from Canada, who gave a talk in which she showed that intense terror terahertz radiation changed the expression of 400 genes in skin cells. We then went to the coffee lounge and had a long discussion because our experiments were clearly showing completely different things. If Ljubljana is right, then this offers a possible new therapy for, for cancer by reversing the confused structure of DNA that has given rise to genetic defects. It's a very promising area of research which we're carrying forward with this group of people. We're taking this forward now on free electron lasers in the terahertz region of the spectrum in Nijmegen in Holland, and we've just been funded by Cancer Research UK to try and resolve this problem and develop new diagnostic equipment. And I draw your attention to the youth of a lot of these people. Uh, Tim Craig, James Ingham, these people are only a few years older than you when they were doing this research. And if you get interested in something like this, then you can do research as well. The most difficult thing in life is to find out what to do. When you've decided what to do, it's much easier to work out a way to do it. Now, finally, let me talk about the Madagascar periwinkle. This is a little plant that lives in the tropical rainforest of Madagascar. It's the source of two molecules. One is used to treat childhood leukemia and changed 
the survival rate from 10% to 95%. The other one is used to cure most victims of Hodgkin's disease. Worldwide sales are 75 million pounds a year. And of course, some of the research is done on synchrotrons to discover the structure of these molecules. And this is still an active field of research. This is Science Magazine, which is published every week or so. And there's an article in last week's issue on the Madagascar periwinkle. And what it says is, the pathways show how plants create chemical diversity and generate bioactive molecules. That's very important. You see, plants discovered chemical warfare. They can't run away from animals, so they must poison them. And so the poisons that we get from plants are the way that we treat disease. If you look at prescriptions in the USA, most of them come from plants. Now, there isn't an issue of Science Magazine which doesn't talk about the extinction of some plant or animal. And it even makes the newspapers. So this is today's Guardian. Fear of a new wave of extinction rises as species feel the heat. Take the Madagascar periwinkle. There were two botanists from America. Incidentally, if you're interested in botany, do not give up. There's a desperate shortage of botanists. We need you before all the plants disappear. So these botanists from America were in Madagascar collecting specimens. And they came across a small field which the local people were clearing to grow crops. And they found just in the corner of this field three or four plants, which they'd never seen before. So they asked the people, could we just put a little fence around this piece? And they agreed. They took a sample of the plants home, and they discovered these two molecules. If they'd come back the week afterwards, it would all have gone. And these people would now be dying of these diseases. So we need the biological diversity before it all goes. You cannot study living things if they're all dead. So I think we ought to take John Saul's comment that a society is defined, defined not only by what it creates, but also by what it refuses to destroy. Thank you.